Good day, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. This session will begin at the top of the hour. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on outcome evaluation. So thanks for completing our poll on daylight savings time. And I saw that a lot of people didn't care. And some even said that it depends on the evidence of whether or not harm is done. Well, we'll have several polls like that throughout the webinar. And they all work the same as the one you just completed. So please make sure to participate in those when you see them. It'll enhance your webinar experience. Today's webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the Evaluation Support Center for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. That's ATE for short. The ATE program involves partnerships between academic institutions and industry to enhance the quantity and quality of technicians working in high-tech fields. Evaluate's mission is to help improve the quality of ATE evaluation. We've developed a website to help us with that mission. It features video recordings, slides, and handouts from past webinars, checklists, templates, and guides to help you with common evaluation tasks, a blog written by real-world STEM evaluators, project leaders, grant specialists, and others, and reports from our annual survey of ATE project leaders. PIs who visit our website can learn how to get the most out of their evaluations. Evaluators can learn how to provide more useful evaluations to their PIs and grant writers can learn more about evaluation planning for their grant proposals. And this website has something for everyone. Speaking of the website, the slides and a handout of key points from today's webinar are already available on our website. And the recording will be available within one to two days. There are already links to these materials on the right side of your screen. So go ahead and check them out. You'll be glad that you did. Before we start, though, uh, I'd like to start with some introductions. Uh, I'm Miranda Lee from Western Michigan University, and I'm your host for today's webinar. With me here today is Lori Wingate, Director of Evaluate. We're located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. I'd also like to take a moment to thank everyone who helped make today's webinar happen. Cheryl Endress and Emma Perk from Evaluate helped with webinar development and Mike Lasecki, Janet Pinhorn, and Tim Suchomsky from Maytech Networks at Maricopa Community Colleges helped to produce today's webinar. Mike also provided feedback on a draft version of the webinar. So please know that the views expressed in this webinar today are those of the presenters, and they do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. Today, we're going to cover three important topics. First, we'll discuss how to lay the foundation for an outcome evaluation by identifying intended outcomes and evaluation questions. Then we'll talk about planning for data collection. And finally, we'll cover how to interpret evaluation results to reach conclusions. There are question breaks after each section, so please make sure to type any questions you have into the chat box. I'll keep track of them, and we'll answer them during the question breaks. So now, I'd like to get things going by welcoming Lori back to the webinar. Thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us today. Um, the most fundamental step in outcome evaluation is clearly defining a project's intended outcomes. And once those are defined, then you can move on to developing evaluation questions to frame the outcome evaluation. And those are the first two steps in outcome evaluation. Then you need to thoroughly plan for data collection and beyond, that is determining not only how you'll gather the data, but also how you will use the data to answer the evaluation questions. And then, of course, you'll collect and analyze those data. And finally, you interpret the results, that is, you'll make meaning of the data and actually answer the evaluation questions. 
So this webinar will cover these steps in three sections, as Miranda noted earlier and is shown here. We won't get into the actual uh, collection and analysis of data, and that's when you put your social science res research skills into action. Um, in that last point, in the last part of the webinar, we'll cover interpretation, so the process of answering the evaluation questions. So a program or project outcome is any change that is directly or indirectly brought about by project activities and products. In education contexts, we're typically expecting changes in things like knowledge, skills, attitudes, behavior, even social or economic conditions. In contrast, an activity is what a project does, the actions it takes to bring about those outcomes. And a goal is any achievement being sought by a project. And project goals could focus on either activities or outcomes or both. So an activity goal is about what a project will do, while an outcome goal is about what difference it's going to make in the world. For example, at Evaluate, um, our resource center, we could have an activity focus goal like this one to, be, to do four webinars a year, serving 1,000 people. We can also have an outcome goal for webinar participants to improve their knowledge and practice with regard to evaluation. So we never want to assume that outcomes and goals are one and the same. If you do, you can end up focusing your outcome evaluation on something other than outcomes. And this is a pretty important point, and I want to make sure you can all spot the difference between activity goals and outcome goals. So on the next few slides, I'm going to share four examples of real goal statements from real advanced technological education projects, and I obtained these from the National Science Foundation's award database. So I'll ask you to read each one, and then a poll will come up, and it will ask you to indicate whether the statement is about an activity, a goal, or both. So here is the first one. And when, by the way, whenever you see a slide like this with a color border, it means you're going to be asked to answer a poll. So that's a cue that you're going to have to do something. So take a moment to read this statement. The poll will appear in a moment. And then take, uh, use your mouse to click what you think is the best answer, whether it's an activity goal, an outcome goal, or a mixture. Okay, if you haven't put your answer in, do so. We're going to close the poll and just, well, not close it. We're going to broadcast the results in just a moment. Wow, 357 people on the webinar. That's fantastic. Okay, Mike, why don't we go ahead and broadcast those results? I think, okay, so now you guys are seeing them. So, wonderful. So 70% um, selected an outcome goal. And if we could take the poll away, thank you. So you're right, this is definitely an outcome goal. The project activities are intended to result in an increase in the number of cybersecurity professionals. So this is a change in workforce conditions. Okay, another one. How about this one? Just the uh, same process. Take a moment to read it. The poll will come up and go ahead and answer it. Okay, if you haven't already, select your answer, and I'll have my broadcast the results. Okay, 60, it keeps growing. Again, almost 70% of you so far are selecting an activity goal. Okay, um, we can close the poll. And um, definitely, so creating a degree program is an activity. Now, it's a large and important activity, but it's still the doing of the project, right? And you, you, most of you can see that. Um, if you create the de degree program, imagine you create it and it's not utilized by people, then there aren't going to be outcomes in terms of changes in what people know, think, or do. And here's another one.
Okay, get your answer in now if you haven't already. And then I'll ask Mike to broadcast the results so everybody can see how it's going. Yep, I think it's safe to show the results now or maybe Oh, see, I you can see them. Okay, sorry. Yep. So 84% of you have selected an outcome, which is fantastic. We can close the poll. Thanks. So um, now on this one, you might have been tentative about saying an, it's an outcome. Uh, it is an outcome, as, as you all, as almost all of you uh, noted, because it's a change in what people know about these STEM disciplines. But the statement covers a lot of ground, doesn't it? So all of science, technology, engineering, and math all women, all underrepresented minorities. So it, it does lack the specificity that we want to see in an intended outcome that could serve as the basis for an outcome evaluation. But it is outcome focused because it's a change. It's about, a ch it's about change in what people know. And here's our last one, and it's a little bit longer, so I'll give you a little more time. Okay, get your answer in. You guys, I can see them answers flying in. Uh, if you haven't registered your answer, do so now and we'll show those results. Okay, we have a little bit more of a split here with uh, roughly a little bit less than half saying it's an activity and a little more than half saying it's both and not very many people saying it's an outcome. Okay, so let's close those results and we'll move on. It really was quite an activity focused goal here. So it's about creating the program and using a specific piece of equipment. It sounds pretty cool, right? Um, but it doesn't get at what's supposed to be different for students because of these activities. Now we could extrapolate, but this statement in and of itself doesn't talk about an outcome. Now these examples aren't, the point of this isn't to be critical of these goals. They're totally fine goals. Um, it's just that they're not always focused on outcomes, right? Um, as we've seen in these examples, sometimes you know perfectly legit goals are, are activity focused. Um, and we saw in at least one example, even when goals are focused on outcomes, they may be a little bit too vague or lofty or, or lack some specificity that we want to serve as a focus for an outcome evaluation. So the point of this, this is just to be careful that we don't assume that uh, outcome evaluation is the same as goal evaluation, all right? So when defining intended outcomes for a project as the basis for a project evaluation, we're looking for specific and realistic statements about what is expected to change for people in relation to the need that the project is designed to address. So any outcomes that are put forth as the focus of an outcome evaluation, I suggest you put them up against this definition or something similar before you proceed with evaluation planning. Now for the rest of this webinar, we're gonna use a case that's based on a real ATE project called Growing a New Generation of Energy Technicians and Professionals. And the proposal for this project is used by NSF in mock panel reviews. And Celeste Carter for NSF was kind enough to share it with me for teaching purposes. And in the rationale for this project, the proposal uh, states, um, includes a quote from a report by the 21st Institute for 21st Century Energy. It states, our energy industry employs millions of people today, yet nearly half of this workforce is expected to retire in the next 10 years. We need additional education and training programs that enable the American energy sector to attract and retain a new generation of human capital. Now, the actual project has five goals, but for efficiency's sake, we're just gonna look at the first three. And the first is to improve and expand academic rigor and relevance across core technology curriculum and wind energy technology specific curriculum. Goal two is to design and to put into action wind and renewable energy career pathways. And goal three is to enhance and expand recruitment, retention, 
and placement efforts across technology programs. And here are those goal statements. And I'm not going to ask you to do a poll on what type of goals these are, because I know you're already all pros at this. I'm just going to highlight some keywords and point out that these really are action oriented. So these are activity goals. So we can take these activity goals and put them in the activities column of this logic model format. And we're going to use a logic model today as a tool for determining uh, outcome evaluation questions, but we're not going to get into the specifics of how to create a logic model. We do have some links to good resources on that topic on our webinar handout, however. So a logic model prompts us to define multiple levels of outcomes. So for this project, the long-term outcome was pretty easily inferred from that quote that I shared with you from the rationale for the project. The project is seeking to increase the supply of qualified technicians to regional wind and renewable energy employers. So that can go right there in that long-term outcome column. But that leaves a big gap between activities and the desired long-term outcome. So we need to identify some interim outcomes to connect those dots. Then we're not in an all or nothing situation for the outcome evaluation. And also, I think importantly, gathering data on these interim outcomes can also shed light on the project's progress toward that long-term outcome and maybe even reveal opportunities for improvement along the way. So this process of filling in these gaps and working out a logic model is best done with the evaluator engaging project stakeholders to really build this logical case for how activities get translated into outcomes. But the takeaway here is not the specific contents of these boxes, OK? I really just want to show you this as a strategy for linking activities to long-term outcomes and illustrate how you'll have a much richer outcome evaluation if you don't focus on one single outcome. Um, when you do our feedback survey at the end of this webinar, you'll see examples of some of the short-term outcomes that we're trying to bring about with our webinars. And, and how we measure those. So here's what I would recommend as the focus of the outcome evaluation. You'll notice I'm not including that first short-term outcome. That one is about instructors changing their course content and methods. And that is a short-term outcome because it's a change in behavior that the project seeks to bring about. But the project's main focus, the reason it exists, is to change things for students um, and, and the wind and energy industry, not a for faculty. So the behavior change on the part of the instructors, yes, it should be monitored and reinforced, but I wouldn't include it in the formal outcome evaluation. So that leaves us with four outcomes that focus on changes for students and employers. And these will be the focus of this outcome evaluation. Now we could stop here, but I am, we're going to go on to another step and actually frame specific outcome evaluation questions. Now when you see an outcome this outcome about students utilizing career pathways. You may be inclined to pose a question uh, like, did students use the career pathways established by the project? But that's really a yes or no question, isn't it? It means we're going to have to determine where that dividing line is between yes and no. So basically, it's set up to be like a pass-fail kind of proposition. So my advice is to avoid these kinds of yes-no questions, because it's probably not how you really want to answer the question or even tend to, intend to, and it's not all that useful, really, in the end. So I suggest something more like this which asks about the extent to which students are using the career pathways established by the project. And this kind of question invites a wider range of possible, more nuanced conclusions. So this is going to be our first evaluation question in this example. And you can see how it maps right on to that intended short-term outcome. Now, the second intended outcome is about the number and diversity of students who enroll and persist in these energy programs at the college. There's a lot packed into this outcome, OK? And your first inclination, again, might be to pose an evaluation question about how many students enrolled in the program. But that would be a data point, not a conclusion, right? Um, a number can't really stand on its own without context for interpreting the number. I've seen too many evaluation reports that just give a string of findings without generating any meaningful conclusions. So my advice is to avoid questions that can be answered with a number. But we can ask a question like this, which is about the impact of the program on student diversity, enrollment, and persistence. Now, there's still a lot going on in this question, so it would need to be unpacked further. But this is the, more of the kind of big picture question we're looking for, rather than questions that call for just a single number or a single data point. 
or even a yes no. So for this midterm outcome, I'm suggesting that the evaluation question focus on the extent to which students are gaining competencies needed by energy industry employers. And we can ask a similar question about the extent to which the project is increasing the supply of qualified technicians to the energy sector. Now the take home here again is not so much the specific content of these boxes, or I mean these questions, but this strategy of using the logic model uh, to plot different levels of outcomes and actually mapping the evaluation questions onto these outcomes to ensure you've got good coverage of the outcomes across the evaluation question and that you're not focusing evaluation questions on things that aren't like real, really important to the project. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so some points to sum up. You absolutely have to make sure there are clear and appropriate statements about intended project outcomes before you proceed with planning an outcome evaluation. It's a good idea to identify multiple levels of outcomes so you're not putting all of your eggs into that basket of long-term outcomes, so to speak. And you want to orient evaluation questions to those intended outcomes. And ask evaluation questions that allow for a range of conclusions, not just yes, no, or pass, fail, or a single number. And here's a bonus tip. Always include an additional question that goes something like this. What are the project's unintended positive or negative side effects or outcomes? You don't want to get so focused on intended outcomes that you get tunnel vision. You always want to be on the lookout for unintended results. And having a question like this can just serve as a reminder to look for the unexpected in your data. We're about to have our first question break. Um, but first, I just want to point you to some of the useful resources on our handout. There's a link to the Getting to Outcomes Manual by the RAND Corporation. And there, the chapter eight of that has a really nice overview of outcome evaluation. And then we have a couple of resources on logic models, including our logic model template for ATE projects and the University of Wisconsin Extension's free online course on logic models. And then from their site, there's also many, many other great resources on logic models. And then uh, the evaluation questions checklist, which I authored with um, Daniela Schroeder, has defines criteria for good evaluation questions and also uh, says what not to do, similar to what we talked about. And uh, let's see, the Michael Patton, this is the only non-open access resource we have on the handout, but it's definitely worth the effort of getting it. Um, he does a wonderful job of talking about how to work with stakeholders to define meaningful program outcomes and not just go directly to those goals. So now I'm going to turn things over to Miranda for your questions before we move on to planning for data collection and beyond. Okay, thank you, Lori. So we have a number of questions uh, that came up, and um, please make sure to continue to um, type them into the chat box, and I will address them in the order they were received. So our first question is from Sharanya, and it is, is the part about, quote unquote, to enhance process, um, et cetera, not getting at the outcome? Can you just read that one more time? And I'll Sure. So is the part about uh, to enhance process um, not getting at the outcome? I'm sorry that I don't understand the question. Um, I'm going to interpret it, and then sh maybe she can follow up in the chat. But if you're talking about process versus outcome evaluation, um, we're, in this webinar, we're strictly focusing on outcome evaluation. Definitely uh, encourage process evaluation as well. Um, I'd like to point out too that with looking at the shorter term outcomes is uh, and seeing how those are progressing through the life of a project is also a really uh, great way to use evaluation findings in a formative way. Um, so looking at those results to improve as you're going. So Sharanya clarified, and it was in relation to one of the specific examples. Um, that you had presented um, earlier on. Um, so if Sharanya could um, clarify that question more. Dilara uh, asked, could building a sustainable program be the outcome? 
um, building a sustainable program be the outcome? Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't really have a problem with that, but think about what's behind that word sustainable, right? That means that there's students coming in, that there's a need for the program, that it's fulfilling a need in, in the workforce in this particular example or in the world. So sustainable actually embeds quite a lot of sort of outcome variables in it, I think. You don't have a sustainable program if no one's coming to it, if it doesn't serve an important need, if it can't uh, maintain itself. So I think it's, it is, I can see how it can be construed as an outcome, but I'd want to articulate it in a different way. I'd want to articulate it in terms of what, how people are being served, how, how the world is a better place, even if it's just our small slice of the world, um, in terms of the need that we're addressing. That's how I, I would frame it in those terms. Okay, so the clarification was that was in relation to example goal number four. Um, the project's goal uh, is to build a sustainable program to enhance process technology education. Just to clarify. Oh gosh, that I I can't remember that, so I'll have to look. Yeah, that was in one of the goal examples, right? Yes. So that's not in my head right now, so I can't. I'm. I'll have to uh, address that later because I've. Just don't remember it well enough. Sure. Okay, so Max asked, what is the difference between a long-term outcome and an impact? Oh gosh, when we get into evaluation terminology, there's so many different ways that people define these terms, right? Um, I think for a lot of people, and I think it's the way I think about it as well, that if we're talking about long-term outcomes, we are, it's kind of the same as impact. It's like, what's the big picture? What's the ultimate result that we're trying to achieve here? So I don't want to split hairs over terminology. Um, that tends to be how I define it. But if you're doing evaluation for a particular client or sponsor, I definitely would look into how they define these terms and, and, and do your work in accordance with the definitions that is the way they understand things and, and the language they want to use. So that's what I would defer to a, a client or a, a funding sponsor and how they want to define these things. It's not so much the terms, but the meaning behind them. Sure. Eugenie asked, wasn't the number of students a possibly an outcome indicator? So yes, indicator, absolutely. Numbers of things can be in you can be an indicator. Vi totally. My point about numbers is that we don't want to ask evaluation questions that can be answered with a number. And we're I'm going to illustrate that in the last part of the webinar about why that's an issue. But absolutely, in terms of using different indicators and multiple indicators to answer those larger evaluation questions, there's no problem with um, using indicators that are quantitative. In fact, I mean. It, that's all, you can hardly get away from that. It's like pretty critical. Bamene asks, what are some examples of how the short-term and mid-term questions be measured in the examples? Oh, how they would be measured? Mm -hmm. um, I'd have to look at my, those questions. You guys ask hard questions. Oh, utilizing the pathways. Okay, we're going to, we're actually going to look at um, the second outcome, the number and diversity of students who enroll and persist. We're going to look at just a couple of indicators uh, for that in the last section. In terms of uh, students gaining competencies, um, that can be uh, done, for example, many industries have competency standards. Um, and certification processes. So if, if wind energy, and I don't know if it is, has a certification or a set of competencies established, then we would create um, tests or performance measurements to, to get hard data on whether students are achieving those competencies. So I don't hear any audio. Maybe it's time to go ahead to the next section. Yes. Um, thank you all for your questions. I have made sure to capture the remainder. We will um, take some steps to answer those questions that were unanswered after the webinar. Thank you. Okay, Lori? All right. Well, thanks, Miranda, and uh, thanks for all your great and challenging questions, and I apologize I couldn't uh, reverse my memory to, to what some, some of those questions were asking. I'm sure they came up as I was talking. Um, so in this section, we're talking about planning for data collection and beyond. And I say and beyond because this step isn't just about figuring out how to get the data. It's also thinking ahead to how those data will be used to actually answer evaluation questions. Now, the data collection plan elements I'm going to review will be familiar to many of you on this webinar. What may be different is that I'm recommending that you plan data collection around specific evaluation questions. So too often uh, 
in my experience, data collection plans get really detailed with regard to things like sampling and methods. And those are important, but it's easily when you get into the details of those to lose sight of why you're gathering the data in the first place, what questions you're trying to answer with evidence. So you need to lay out a clear-cut plan for how each evaluation question will be addressed. So I'm recommending that you specify what indicators will be used. That is, what you will measure that is indicative of the outcomes of interest in the evaluation. For example, if you were surveying students, are you measuring their satisfaction with the program, uh, their self-assessments of competence, their employment plans? So too often I see descriptions of methods without information about what's actually going to be measured. And that's why you should talk about indicators independently of how that information will be obtained. Now, once you've defined what will be measured, then you can explain where that information will come from and using what means. And this is where you'll get into the technical things like specific data collection methods or the surveys or observations and so on. And also where you'll deal with sampling and instrumentation. I do suggest you look for opportunities to measure things, the same indicators in multiple ways uh, to build your body of evidence and be specific about who will be responsible for which aspects of the data collection. So this isn't a technical issue, so it may seem out of place here, but it's really important for ensuring the plan is doable. In the ATE program, it's typical for internal and external evaluation teams to share responsibility for different aspects of the evaluation. So you need to be clear about who's doing what and put, you know, always put agreements in writing so everyone knows what they're responsible for and include timing in the data collection plan. When evaluating a grant-funded project in an academic setting, it's especially important to make sure your data collection activities are well-timed with consideration of the academic schedule and also when reports are due to funders. These two elements, personnel and timing, um, these are crucial for ensuring the plan is feasible given the resources available for this, the evaluation work, including the human resources, the funding, the technology, whatever it is. And now a lot of data collection plans will stop here, um, but I'm going to say push on and think to analysis and interpretation. Uh, if you actually want to get to answers to evaluation questions, those pieces are essential. So analysis. This is the process of transforming that raw data into usable information. And this might include, you know, if you're dealing with qualitative data and identifying themes, um, if you've got statistics, maybe it's simple descriptive statistics or even complex things like effect sizes and correlation coefficients, propensity scores, whatever it is. Um, but decide ahead of time how you'll analyze data because it will likely affect how you should gather the data. Um, I ex had this experience just a couple of years ago where I did a self use a self-assessment scale that was seven points that someone else had created, and I thought it was a great scale. But when I went to analyze, I realized I wanted to group people into low, medium, and high competency, and I couldn't group them because I had an odd number scale. So it, it just wasn't going to work out, and I found that very frustrating. So, you know, I've learned the hard way, not just from that example, but the value of really planning the details of analysis well before any data are collected. Now note that analysis is not the same as interpretation, although they're often conflated. So this little guy has determined the height of his the water in this glass, and, and he's done he's measured it in inches. So his measurement and his analysis is complete. But now he needs to interpret this finding to determine if this glass is half empty or half full. And we'll get to more in, into interpretation in the last part of the webinar. But in short, interpretation is what you do so you can actually answer those evaluation questions. So that sort of rounds out data collection planning. So again, plan these elements out for each question. So instead of by method, do it by question. So here's an example of a plan that specifies each of these points in a matrix format. And yes, it's kind of annoying to have a table with so many columns, I agree. Um, but the value of this is that it forces you to think distinctly about each indicator and doesn't let you gloss over those tricky issues. Um, so note that the evaluation question is about the extent to which students used uh, the career pathways. And we have two indicators. It's a partial list. And we're going to look at the second one. Um, and this is about the number and percentage of dual enrolled students who intend to pursue degree and certificate programs.
And that information will be obtained through a survey of these students. And the external evaluator will have responsibility for designing the survey and performing the analyses, but the faculty will do the actual administration. And the survey will be conducted at the end of each semester, and there won't be a lot of wiggle room on that because it will be important to do it near the end of the term, but not during finals week, right? So we have to think through those calendar issues. And the analysis will mainly be descriptive to statistics, but note that the data will be disaggregated by demographic characteristics. So we'll want to make sure we have those demographic characteristics tied with whatever data we want to analyze. And the qualitative analysis will be done through inductive coding. And we'll make sense of these results by comparing them with performance targets set by the project using a rubric created for that purpose. And we're going to deal with rubrics in the next section. So again, putting the data collection plan elements in a table like this is an effective way to check that your plan is realistic and comprehensive and you've kind of thought through all the ways it can fall apart. Uh, again, separating the indicators from the data sources and methods forces you to think about what you actually intend to measure, the construct you intend to measure, not just the means by which you're going to obtain the information. So to further underscore this point, consider this statement. And I could have plucked this from any number of evaluation plans I've seen in the past, especially the sort of, you know, abbreviated plans that appear in funding proposals. It states that the uh, evaluation will include a survey of students and secondary analysis of institutional data. So the survey is a data collection method, and students and institutional data are sources. But it doesn't say what's actually going to be measured. Again, is it satisfaction? Is it their intent to pursue a certain major uh, demographic characteristics? It's just not clear. It's not stated. And that's why it's so important to clarify what indicators will be used and then explain where and how that information will be obtained. Now, you can't do that kind of glossing over that I showed you when you use a matrix format for presenting this information. It really does make you think through a lot of the details and can save you from headaches down the road. Now, if you're doing an outcome evaluation, you need to set yourself up to be able to determine whether or not observed outcomes are really due to the project. Uh, if you observe an outcome but you can't link it to the project, those are just coincidences, as this quote from Jane Davidson points out. So you need to be able to show that the changes are really actually caused by the project, or at least that they, that the project contributed to those changes. Some options for linking cause and effect include using control and comparison groups, and that's where you get into experimental and quasi-experimental designs, which we're not going to cover in this webinar. And it's also a good idea to make effort to learn what else is going on in a project's environment that could account for observed outcomes. So you can rule out alternative explanations. An often overlooked option um, is just to ask participants directly. And I'll show you one example of this, and you'll see another way of doing this in our feedback survey at the end of this webinar. So here's a question that asks students about the likelihood that they will seek a job in the renewable energy field. So it's a fine question alone. Uh, I mean, it's a fine question, but it's not going to tell us um, about the project's influence on this decision. So as an isolated question, it's pretty limited. But if we asked a second question like this one, we're going to learn more about the project's influence on the student. So the question itself links the cause and effect, and the response scale captures both the magnitude and the direction of the change. And yes, it's self-report data, which isn't the strongest kind, but that's why we want to build a body of evidence using different sources and types of data. But you can always build in, take these small steps to build causation into your data collection to enhance your ability to link activities with outcomes. So to sum up this section, align data collection to evaluation question. Develop concrete plans for data collection, yes, but also for analysis and interpretation to ensure that those evaluation questions can be answered. And build cause and effect into data collection whenever you can, including by asking participants directly for their opinions and perceptions of how a project affected them. I'm going to point you to a couple resources. Um, well, three, I guess. Getting to Outcomes Manual, again, has a nice overview of various designs and methods that are useful in outcome evaluation. 
Um, Evaluate has a data collection matrix template, which is just a blank version of the matrix that I walked you through. And we also have a couple resources um, in the handout that deal with causation in evaluation uh, that are very useful. So now it's time for our second question break. Okay, thank you, Lori. So uh, Carlos asks, in the table slash framework that you presented, um, it might be good to insert a column on indicator definition. What are your thoughts? I definitely think that's a good idea. I've seen um, paid one to three page definitions of indicators. Um, and I definitely think explanation and rationale and why and how it will be measured, that is a, a great thing to do to further explain it. It's not really feasible to put it in a small um, cell like that, but I think that, um, yeah, any, the, the more you can do to get really concrete about what data are going to be collected, how they're going to be used and analyzed, and to make sure you have a good rationale for it. It's not on our, um, it's not on our handout, but on our, Oh, we'll have to send you the link separately. It's on the evaluation checklist website um, at Western Michigan University where we are, but it's not part of the Evaluate website. There's a checklist on indicators by Goldie McDonald. So I'd encourage you to, to look at that for a real in-depth look at how indicators should be explained. Great. What if an outcome is unintended? Do we still call it a mere coincidence? That was from Oren. No, I would not call it a coincidence. So it's like the point about that quote with coincidences is if you have an outcome, but you can't, even if it was intended, you can't make a strong case that the project caused that outcome, um, then it, it, you, it's not an outcome, it's a coincidence. Now, you, an unintended outcome could occur, and I'll give you an example more of a side effect. Uh, Elaine Kraft was on a webinar once and she was telling us about a situation where there was a project similar to this where they were beefing up recruitment trying to bring people into a particular technology program and in looking at their data she realized what was happening unintendedly and sort of a negative side effect was they were siphoning students from a different technology program so that wasn't what they intended to do right but it was something that happened and they could pretty pretty well show that it was a cause by the project so that's an unintended outcome. You stated survey data has its limits. Do you have any other tips for other data sources? And this is from Portia. Um, yeah, so what I had pointed out was, yes, self-report data has, has its limits, absolutely. Um, I think you always want to look for multiple sources. So observations, um, if you can track students over time, and one of the ways to do that is the National Student Clearinghouse data, which track is a, is a national data set that tracks students from institution to institution. So if you want to see what happens, uh, you know, from your, to your college students and where they go, um, that's one way of an independent measure other than asking people. I mean, I think surveys are pervasive because it's, it's just so practical to ask people, you know, what's going on in their lives and, um, but, you know, institutional data, if you're, you know, at an educational institution, they usually have lots of information uh, that can track students individually in terms of, you know, what courses they're taking, their grades, um, you know, whether they change majors and so forth. So, I mean, if you have to, surveys are great, but they, they do have their limits, and you always want to look for other ways to, to capture data. It really depends on the context you're working in. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for the questions. Again, um, we'll make sure to address any unanswered questions. Um, Lori, I'd like to turn it back over to you. Thank you. All right. Um, good, challenging questions. So in the last, in the previous section, we talked about thinking ahead to how data will be interpreted when developing your data collection plan. Basically, how you'll um, make in this part, we're talking about how you'll make sense of those findings in order to answer the evaluation questions. And I keep hammering on that, right? Um, so that's what we're going to deal in this part, so interpreting information. So on that note, I'd like you to answer the poll that will appear on your screen in just a second. You're going to, um, it's going to ask you for your assessment of this sapoti fruit. Is it perfectly ripe, underripe, or overripe? So I can see the answers coming through. It's very interesting, but I'll hold, keep you in suspense for just a minute.
takes a while for almost 400 people to answer a poll. Let's go ahead and pull up your answer in there if you haven't already, and then we'll close the poll in just a second. All right, Mike, let's see those results. All right, so we have more than half of you saying this is an overripe fruit. Well, for those of you who are not familiar with this, this fruit is often compared to chocolate pudding and its consistency and its flavor. So in fact, this fruit is ripe and ready to eat. There will be a point to this. Okay, same thing for this banana. Well, more than 200 of you so far have selected the same choice. So I think it's nearly unanimous. All right, so yeah, 95% of you are choosing uh, the overripe option. Okay, now, whether you were aware of it or not, to make sense of this banana, you had to compare it with something. And you probably have a fair amount of firsthand experience with bananas, I'm guessing. If so, you probably compared this image of this old banana to your store of knowledge about bananas. So at the most basic level, interpretation or sense making requires comparison of information presented to us with something else. And we often rely on our prior knowledge or even contextual cues in that pro process. We need some point of reference. Now, if you're like, like my colleagues here at the Evaluation Center, this fruit exercise may have raised questions in your mind about the context and intended use for this banana. Was it for banana bread, for example? Um, your personal preferences for banana ripeness your cultural competence to assess a sapote fruit versus a banana. And these are all valid points and would be a lot of fun to explore, but let's go back to our case. So consider this fictitious data point from our case example. Um, what's your judgment of this data point? Similar to the banana question, although not about ripeness. Poll will come up any moment and you can put in your answer. probably have to think about this a little bit, right? I'll give you a second. The, again, this is the case that we're using. Um, that is a real case. Everything I've shown you so far has been real about this case. I will say this 15% is made up because I don't actually have access to the eva their evaluation data, just the proposal. Okay, put your answer in if you haven't already. All right, so many of you are selecting um, almost 30% are saying this is a poor result. Most of you, well, the bulk of you, right? 40% just don't know how to make sense of this. I get that. And a few are saying we've got people across the board. Okay, very interesting. Let's take the poll down. So it's hard to interpret this data point without any other information, right? Well, it just so happens that the proposal for this project said its target for, for women <clears throat> would be for women to make up 10% of the students in this program, and that they were starting from a baseline of 1%. And those are real data points, by the way. Um, that 15% is starting to look a lot more substantial now. And with the project starting in 2010, we know that the increase didn't begin until after project implementation began. So that's going to be important because it helps support the claim that the increase is due to the project and didn't start uh, before that. Another data point that helps us interpret this 15% figure is that 2% of wind turbine technicians in the U.S. are women. And that's also a true fact, as opposed to another kind of fact, sorry. Um, and while 15% may be far from the ideal we'd want to see of 50% or so, within this constellation of data points, we can make sense of it and we can more clearly see and substantiate that it's actually a pretty good result. So again, Data interpretation is going to require some kind of comparison. This can mean comparison um, using comparison or control groups, comparing results with preset performance targets or with national data, or looking back in time and comparing with baselines or historical trends, 
We can compare project results with established standards of quality or benchmarks. And we can consider stakeholder expectations as well. Whatever sources or strategies we use, it just it shouldn't be a mystery to the evaluation consumer, right? So next we're gonna look at one strategy for creating explicit and transparent decision rules for reaching conclusions and answering evaluation questions. So here are the project's performance targets and these were included in its funding proposal. Remember they were aiming to make uh, to have women make up 10% of the students in the program. They also set targets for the number of veterans and percentage of underrepresented minority students. So these figures are straight from the proposal. Now remember what I had said about those targets and avoiding yes, no question. It's fine to have targets like these, but if you use them as the basis for the evaluation, it's setting things up to say either the targets were met or not met, which can be problematic. So think about it. If the result had been 9%, would you be comfortable say, saying that the program failed, that it didn't reach its target, um, when those comparison points were less than 1% as a baseline and just 2% of women uh, are, are, wind, are turbine technicians nationally? I mean, 2% of technicians are women. So here's just a slight adjustment where I've taken those targets and used them to create a continuum. It's not all that different, but you can see, I hope, that it allows a little more flexibility than just a yes, no conclusion. We've got three levels now, below, on target, and above target. And here's an alternative, which stretches out to four levels of impact to match the language that's in, in the evaluation question about impact. And this is based on those preset targets from the project proposal. But you can draw on a variety of sources, information sources to create rubrics like this. Then you can apply the rubric to the evaluation findings. For example, we had 15% of women in the program, and that falls in the high impact category. Then these ratings can be averaged, they can be weighted um, to reach an overall conclusion. And however you do that, whatever process you use to synthesize it, now you have a trail of sort of data breadcrumbs to show how you got to those conclusions. So here we have the, con the conclusion that the project had high impact on diversity supported with specific data points in the rubric. And this is gonna be a lot more compelling than a sort of wishy-washy conclusion like the program seems to be doing a good job in terms of enhancing student diversity. And that's what we often see in evaluation reports. But, and that can be okay, but not if there's not an explanation of how that conclusion was reached. And rubrics can be qualitative too. In this example, we're looking at the degree of industry engagement, which is something that a lot of ATE projects are interested in. Um, and you probably wouldn't have a lot of quantitative indicators on this aspect, but that doesn't mean you can't measure it and assess it. So whether quantitative or qualitative or mi a mixture, rubrics are a tool for getting really explicit and transparent about how judgments are, will be made in relation to the indicators or in relation to the overall evaluation questions. Now, when creating rubrics or any kind of decision rule for how evaluation findings will be interpreted, it's important to engage stakeholders. So do background research on the program and bring some facts and some data points to the table to have dialogue with the stakeholders about what success should look like. And you can actually draft rubrics together or bring drafts for input by stakeholders. I actually um, do, I definitely suggest trying out the rubrics with, with fictional data to make sure they're really going to be work, work. And don't be shy about tweaking them. Um, it's really okay to modify them. The important thing is to document the process and the rationale behind these decisions, leaving a clear trail from the data to the conclusions so others can follow and you know even, maybe even replicate your process. So two main points to sum up this section. We want to answer evaluation questions in the same terms in which they're asked. We want to be explicit and transparent about the interpretation process. Now, I know I've thrown a lot of information at you in this section, so especially in those tables, right? So if you feel like it went too fast, I would encourage you to go back to the slides when you have a little more time and you can review them in more detail. We do have one resource on our handout related to rubrics. It's a guide for developing and using rubrics and evaluation by Judy Oakton. So check out that when you have a chance. And now, <clears throat> excuse me, it's time for our final question break. OK, thank you, Lori. So we have a question from Dagamar. That is, do you think that simply asking um, to participate would be seen as a valid and sufficient way to demonstrate the cause and effect relationship? 
I'm sorry, that simply asking participants would be seen as a valid and sufficient way to demonstrate the cause-effect relationship. So I, I went really fast. So asking participants, you got to say it again. I'm sorry, okay. it's a little bit slower. So the question was, do you think that simply um, talking to participants would be seen as valid and sufficient way to demonstrate the cause-effect relationship? Oh, OK, thank you. That's a very good question. And I would say, in and of itself, no. And that's why we want to build a body of evidence. So you know, if you, I think it's a really important one to ask people. I think that, that that task is undervalued. But let's say that you had data points suggesting that uh, something was leading to some sort of change. And then you talk to people, and in fact, they're saying, no, it wasn't it at all. So it, it's not just about getting them to say that the project caused the change. It also can be a counterfactual or, or confirmatory or a, a process where you it, it disconfirms or refutes, I don't know what the word is, um, a trend you're seeing. So I would say it's just one of many things you should do in looking to build a body of evidence, make a case that something did or did not cause a, a, an outcome. OK, thank you. And finally, Sarah asked, what is your recommendation when we, when we have to do an outcome evaluation when we're not so sure about the quality of the data we'll be able to collect? Yes. So one thing I've done in the past when I've used, uh, I've set up some quantitative, some rubrics for interpreting quantitative data. I actually weighted the indicators um, in, according to not only their importance was is an important indicator, but also the quality of the data. So you definitely don't want to put too much stock in shaky data. I was had an experience once where people were sitting down to make decisions about something, decisions, future-oriented decisions, looking at it, uh, a survey that had um, of not a very large group of people that had like 10 to 13 percent response rate. And that I don't think is good. We don't want to be in a situation like that. And I actually caution this group to say, I don't think this, you know, this definitely should not be the sole source of information um, in order to make that decision. So we absolutely have to take quality of data, representativeness of data into account when making those interpretations. And I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm pushing this idea of answering evaluation questions and doing interpretation. But if you're in a situation where you don't have sound evidence, I, you know, that is fine. Just say that we do not have adequate evidence to draw a conclusion in relation to this evaluation question. OK, and then we have one final question, a uh, brief question. And that is, are sometimes the targets sort of arbitrary numbers? What is the best appropriate way to set the targets? Right. Sometimes targets are completely arbitrary. So that's why you want, I would want to know what's going into those, those, those targets, right? You want to be careful about those. Um, and also, monitoring things as they go. I'll just give an example from our project. When we first started doing webinars, 50 people was our benchmark for success. 50. That was that was the excellent mark. Now we've grown hugely over time, right? Now we have we had almost 400 people on this webinar. So we've shifted our our benchmark for excellence um, because the situation changed. Uh, so you don't want to you know, it's not worth um, you know, if targets are arbitrary, you don't just use targets for just having them. They should be meaningful. OK, thank you. Well, we've reached the end of our time today. If you have a specific question that was not answered during the webinar, please make sure to use our contact form on the Evaluate's website to submit them, and we will do our best to answer them. We've come to the end of our time today. As mentioned before, we have a feedback survey about our webinar today, so please take some time to complete the survey. The link just appeared on your screen, uh, and we welcome your feedback. Thank you very much. While you're doing the survey, I would like to take a moment to thank everyone for being here today and participating in our webinar. Thanks for the questions, and thanks for interacting during the polls. On behalf of everyone here, we hope you have a great day, and take care.